Good. Okay. Good morning, Stu. Hey, welcome. Thanks yeah. for having me. <laughs> no, it's, it's, I think it's more of a pleasure on my end because there's very few people I get to talk to that I think, and this is my opinion, you can probably humble me and talk a little bit more about it. That has come up with, I think, a school of thought when it comes to uh, a term tactical fitness and a tactical athlete. And that's only because I've spent my years running health clubs early on before I transitioned to become a professor. And it, I was always in, in the arena of fitness. And there's very few people that I know that have developed a way of training that's scientific, that's proven, that works, that culturally, scientifically has crossed other bounds where it's coming to not only uh, maybe a business side, but also the academic side as tactical, fit, tactical fitness and what you've done. And what I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you first. Also, Stu Smith, I want to get everything right for you just because you've accomplished so much. So I just want to make sure that I have your bio correct. And my first, um, introduction to you is when I was an early professor and I needed content. I needed something to show my students of what really happens to the body besides boring, just PowerPoints, because I come the, from the background of business and, and health clubs. And I'm like, Oh guys, you're not going to learn anything. Sure. I could show you academically. That's just, that's easy, but I need to show you how it really works in real life and what you're going to see. And then I came across, of course, your early videos from Net Geo as far as, um, yeah, it's like 10 years ago. I did that. It hasn't been yeah. 10 years. Let's see. Yeah. Where, yeah, yeah maybe, that's maybe, yeah. Yeah. So did the term tactical fitness, obviously we know tactical, we know fitness. Was that a term that you can say you kind of developed into a school of thought or kind of coined that phrase as far as maybe it's book publishing, what you do, or is that kind of a term that you knew early on in your, in your uh, history of training young people to get into um, special operations, law enforcement. Was that a term? I well, want to I, I, I I, believe I, you developed that as far as to from the small T tactical to the big T tactical. So I'll let you. Uh, right. Well, I, I will share this with you. This is a, a pretty neat story because in the 90s, I, you know, I got out of the military mm -hmm. and uh, late 90s and uh, started basically working out and writing about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that was my, my, was my line. And I was considering different areas in the world of fitness. And there are many, all right. There are many genres out there. People have these different niche in fitness mm -hmm. and, you know, there's people that just focus on abs, right. There's people that just, you know, bodybuilding or whatever, you know, and it's, right. it's so wide or just swimming or running or rucking, you know, so I, I started writing about fitness tests and all the people who require fitness tests were military law enforcement and firefighters in their journey to become a member of that profession. Mm -hmm. Right. So I figured I said, you know what, let me come up with programs around these fitness tests. And so I was basically doing military law enforcement and firefighter fitness, right? Tactical fitness hadn't been created yet. This was like late 90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, after 9-11, I think the need for war um, and a war footing of our military and anti-terrorism with our military or law enforcement, you know, there's there a lot of stuff going on that occurred. And I think the, the understanding of all of those different uh, you know tactical professions mm -hmm. um, realize that just these fitness tests isn't enough right and like this push-up sit-up two-mile run that the army does is not enough to 
move them in the direction that they need to be. So it needs training. to be a longer type of program where it's not just, okay, one and done, you, you do the test and then you're in, it has to be a long program that sustains successful. Um, uh, yeah. Or just, just a little more job related. Mm -hmm. Right. And the one thing I will say this, the fire department found the job related fitness testing before anybody. So they have a program called the CPAT um, candidate physical aptitude test. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure. Um, and that's basically, they wear all their gear. They do stair steppers. They do uh, sledgehammers. They're dragging hose. They're crawling and doing, uh, you know, through dark thing. I mean, it's a job related fitness right. test. Was that more considered functional stuff back then? Remember back in the day? Yeah. Functional. Yeah, the kind functional. Of, that was more yeah. of a term. And then I think it, it probably yeah. job related or. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would say the evolution was for me, mm -hmm. military, law enforcement, firefighter, fitness didn't really roll off the tongue very well uh, when people asked me what I did. Um, and then it was functional fitness mm -hmm. kind of evolved right. out, of, out of that. And then, you know, the folks at the National Strength and Conditioning Association, they actually coined the term tactical fitness and a gentleman over there by the name Mark Stevenson, who I think is now. You know, he did some time with uh, Navy SEAL mm -hmm. training for a while, and then he now I think he's in professional sports. Um, but they basically created a whole new certification program around tactical fitness, and this is this is the the book NSCA's Essentials of Tactical Strength and Conditioning. It right. is actually a textbook that is really good. Um, yeah, and that's one of the things I want to touch on at some point. We'll talk to that, that I saw once it became academic in kind of a different scope in education, then I thought, okay, this is something that's going to be growing and becoming long-term as far as uh, when we come, when they make a certification, when they make a textbook, then, you know, it's kind of crossed, not just a genre because genre, yes. I think, it, I think that kind of, I don't know. I, I think that's a marginal word for what you do and what that term is, because now it's, it's kind of a broad scope where it not only relates to military, not only relates to law enforcement, but it's a, a proven type of training where if I was going to test it, if we we're going to do it in any kind of scientific setting, any kind of, it, it's proven to increase, increase someone's uh, ability to handle loads of work for a long period of time scientifically but also you can give it a term it's it's still growing and that's oh, sure a point i want to get to too it's kind of a um where do we see it go because it's proven to work the terms make sense tactical fitness fitness or tactical athlete because that's very specific even in a in a career and that diagram that i'll i'll put up it's it's a diagram that you posted of a tactical athlete. And it's kind of a, a diagram where all these different uh, disciplines converge and what you want to look for, for a tactical athlete. And that kind of blew my mind in a second. And when, well, thank you. Yeah, I came well, up with that myself. I, that, and, and that's great. <laughs> that's what kind of made me think, okay, this is someone who not only just understands tactical fitness as a, a, a career and you need to, you know, get yourself ready, whether you're going into any kind of uh, military spe uh, special ops law enforcement, but now it can cross over to a type of career for other people that you can learn about it in school. And that's kind of where I picked up on it. I'm like, okay, this is something I could teach not only, yeah. you know, uh, athletes, but my students who want to get into other exercise science careers, other than just whatever you want to do, personal trainer, right. athletic trainer. Now you can actually do this. And there's an academic book that proves, okay, you can do this now. I can teach this now. Now it's crossed over to just not, I don't know, just a, a, a fitness fad or now this is proven. So that diagram, right. how did you come up with that diagram? It's well, it's funny because, you know, the people I coach are typically, you know, have the term former athlete next to their name, mm -hmm. right? So they come into this world with a history of athletics that you know, when you look at it on the spectrum of what a tactical athlete needs to be, depending on what those athletics were, 
they're going to have a series of strengths and weaknesses that they need to understand and assess. You know, one of the first things we do is we just we go through a multi-level fitness test just to just see where their strengths and weaknesses are, whether that's the regular PST or it's a little more in depth and dealing with some strength tests or speed and agility, timed runs, things like that, um, just to see where their strengths and weaknesses mm -hmm. are. And that Venn diagram is just a one like picture of everything you need to focus on. And I wanted it to be somewhat overwhelming to the athlete that comes in and he's, let's say he's a power lifting guy that's got strength, power, speed, and agility taken care of, but anything over a hundred yards is long distance and, you know, his endurance of muscle stamina is pretty weak. That's a weakness he right. has to work on. Yeah. You know, so that's a weakness that he needs to work on. And that, that sometimes that's a long progression depending on, you know, the size of that athlete. May that athlete may need to drop 50 pounds before he's going to be able to do a pull-up or be able to run a six-minute mile. You know, and all those you know, those paces and reps mm -hmm. and everything depends on the intensity of those jobs that are that they're trying out for. You know, if it's a special ops job, it may take longer. If it's a regular military or regular law enforcement firefighter job may not require as much time uh it just depends on the you know the selection program that they are about to endure you know and you basically all you have to do is look at the attrition rates and say you know this is an 80 percent attrition rate program and that's for a reason it's really high level athletics and discomfort and dealing, you know, why you really want to do this. I mean, it, it makes you ask those kind of questions in there. So, uh, you know, the, the typical, I would say that, you know, giving a, an athlete a grade and the tactical athlete a grade of their abilities, mm -hmm. I would say an athlete has to be an A or A plus, depending on their sport and level, you know, to make the team and to be an expert at that team. Whereas the tactical athlete, probably needs to be at the B range, but at everything, right? And that athlete specializes on just a couple of those elements of fitness and doesn't need even to worry about the others. Doesn't need to get in the water if he's a land athlete. Doesn't need to worry about speed and agility if he's a marathon runner. You know, so there's, there's uh, different at levels that the tactical athlete has to uh, realize that this is going to be a weakness when they're coming into it and spend time progressing into that weakness. How did that, when you first kind of brought that into uh, outside the military, outside of getting, um, because let's talk about, you're also a facilitator. You help young, uh, young people get ready for either military uh, special ops for either buds or any, I think you probably train with any, everything, everything. Yeah. Yeah. any kind of uh because there's certain standards that you have to meet when you get into any kind of um special operations or uh unique units like um buds or probably army army i'm sure you deal with yep. too um yep. what other i mean all of them army oh. air force marines air. Okay. uh you know whether it's active or reservist or it's you know special ops or regular military of course we also have police officers swat mm -hmm. team officers um, oh, FBI agents that are trying to be, you know, SWAT team officers. Right. I've seen times. that's a growing part of it too. <clears throat> how did it, obviously you, you worked on the military side. How did it work when you kind of tra tried to transition this type of training over to the law enforcement side where maybe, you know, you have to start off doing certain PSTs and maybe in the academy, but after a while, you know, those standards aren't quite as stringent <clears throat> or you don't have to you know, maybe follow that. How did it take like, okay, this works great for getting uh, people into the academy, but we don't really follow it too much after that. Did you notice behind the scenes in uh, the ac uh, academies of law enforcement that they continue to use the tactical fitness program or ideas, not just for their cadets, but long-term? Does it work long-term in those areas too? Whereas in military, you have to do this all the time because that if you're special operations, you're, you're out, you have to be ready all the time whereas sure in law enforcement you have to be ready but that's more of civilian 
Yeah, there, there's a different yeah. um, necessity, I think, yeah. for testing. Um, in the military, they test every six months. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have a fitness test every six months. Those t fitness tests have evolved over the years from like the push up, sit up, pull up, or you know, mile run to um, you know, deadlifts and medicine ball throws and shuttle runs and uh, carries and crawls and you know all these type of things that are now part of military fitness testing um, done every six months. Whereas the law enforcement and firefighters are really kind of on their own after mm -hmm. the academies. Sure. Um, now I will say this: you know, I've I've broken down t the tactical fitness world into three phases and you could call four phases if you want to step it up a notch you can the first phase is what first and second phase is where i kind of put my focus and that is to the young man or woman who wants to serve what's that process they're going to have to pass a fitness test so let's do some specific training to mm -hmm. crush that fitness test that means if you're a power lifter you're going to stop power lifting you're going to focus on calisthenics and cardio Right. If you're a runner and have no upper body strength, you know, we need to focus on some other elements that that you're currently doing. And then the phase two of it is actually preparing for the specifics of your future selection. That could be a police academy, a fire academy, a boot camp, um, a special ops selection. All of those need to have some um a phase or two of, you know, working on the weaknesses mm -hmm. that may be seen, you know, so that you can endure that kind of training program. It's a lot of work, um, you know, daily work, minimal sleep, you know, things like that, that mm -hmm. you have to prepare for. And then phase three is a world that I really don't focus on. Phase three is the active duty operator, right? And what that person has to do. Um, it, it's a bigger ballpark. It's not the same fitness as the phase one and phase two guy. You know, it's not just passing a fitness test. It's not just trying to get in a level of shape to crush a selection. It's more about longevity and maintaining your abilities, mm -hmm. not falling off of those abilities. So it's more difficult to do your job um, and stress mitigation. You know, when you're an active duty tactical operator in any of the fields, you are going to see some things that are tough to see, you know, whether that is accidents or deaths or teammates dying, it's a lot to see. So there is a level of stress mitigation that also has to be part of that phase three um, operator of tactical, you know, tactical fitness third phase of tactical fitness and that's a part of the diagram i'm just pulling it up yeah here. i'll yep. pull it yep because this is what i think makes it complete and the diagram makes sense because you have to add a psychological aspect to any of this otherwise it's not complete and then you're just really just looking at yeah because you have your durability kind of a, longevity is kind of the key for all of the parts in your diagram Mm -hmm. And then you talk about durability, work capacity, stability, stress mitigation, physical, mental, emotional, which I think is the, the key part, not only because of what it takes to be an active duty operator, you have to be mentally ready for all this. You can train all you want, but you know, it's kind of, I guess it works twofold. I've always said this about Ironman training as far as triathlon, you can if you train hard for, let's say, a long distance triathlon, um, uh, 2.4 mile swim, the 112 mile bike, and the marathon, if you're trained for it, your body's ready for it, but then you have to be mentally ready for it. You can't Tony Robbins your way through an Ironman, meaning you can't have mental toughness. I could do this. I could do this. I have a strong mental attitude. But if you didn't do the training, you're right. not going to get through that. It, you can read as many books as you want as you're doing the race, the, 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 the positive aspect, but you kind of have to have both. You don't have the physical. You got to meet the standards and you got to meet those cut, 
you know, cut off times and things mm -hmm. like that, you know, when yeah. you're doing those type of things. And I think that's a component of this diagram that makes it kind of where it scientifically makes sense because you're not just, oh, you're just not talking about being physically fit. Anybody could be physically fit. Yeah, yeah, kind of. But if you don't control the stress about how much stress you have to put on your body, people don't realize how much of this training you have to the workloads get more you have to yeah. meet certain recovery standards. recovery recovery is a very important part yeah because if you don't get the sleep that affects you we all know the research on that how if you're not getting enough sleep how that affects your body just uh, psychologically physiologically if you don't get enough sleep that's why when people say they don't get enough sleep it, oh i don't i don't need to sleep that much i think you kind of do because if you don't get enough sleep that a lot of those recovery aspects, the, your brain's not going to recover. Your body's not going to recover. They want to say that they don't sleep. I don't need it, but you kind of do need it. Otherwise you're not. Absolutely. Gonna yeah. You have and to. Yeah. So the whole bragging thing of, I don't get enough sleep. I, I'm a big believer in sleep because I can tell the difference just because of a crazy life that I have, but you do need that. So I think that that diagram is something that I, I've started to use as a scientific approach to teaching uh, tactical fitness as a possible career, because now you can be certified. You talked about the NSCA, which is kind of a governing body of uh, certifications, um, which you're a part of. You've done. Uh, what, did you have any role in helping with that book? The um, NSCA? Not the actual book, but yeah. I would say every oh man, the first 10 years of tactical fitness conferences. I mean, they, they used to call them symposiums when they were mm -hmm. small you know it'd be like yeah. 15 of us in there right um club, yeah. club, <laughs> club symposium be yeah. there and there'd be like you'd be talking about the same uh you know 10 things with the same 15 people all the time right. years. So and then they they really grew it and it turned into a, a really nice uh you know a tactical fitness conference and training program where vendors come and you mm -hmm. know it, it's a lot of money's now involved with that and, and i would say this you know if there's one thing that any good that comes out of a war, you know, like the last 20 years mm -hmm. is that money is now being spent on scientific and um, evidence-based studies on the tactical athlete. Cause it wasn't before, like when I was starting this in the nineties, you know, any study that I would read was all on professional sports, Mm -hmm. uh olympians or people that you know had some you know morbidity issue that you know that we're trying to deal with they, they had nothing in between right, right. and that's kind of what the tactical athlete is if you want to kind of put them on a spectrum you know it's it's not the unhealthy american it's not the uh olympian it's you know someone right there in the middle and yeah, I mean, that's the tough, that's, you know, things that we've been talking about for decades is trying to get people uh, out of, you know, the, there's other ways to train. And I've been talking to, <clears throat> probably the past two years, most recently, just because things have changed as far as business models, uh, uh, teaching models of what uh, we do as far as uh, living, whether it's running health clubs. I have a lot of friends who run health clubs here in Chicago, and I've talked to them, sat down did podcasts about how they've made it through, you know, the, uh, the pandemic as far as what they had to do to achieve just to stay successful and keep their doors open. And what have we learned from it? We learned that the body is fragile. We learned that immunity is a big key. And those are things that I know we can't, it, we're still talking about it. I mean, it, to, the, to this day, we've been talking about the comorbidities for the past 10, you know, the sure. top 10. Oh yeah. For the past 10 years. And uh, I mean, I, maybe you don't see it as much as people in the general health club industry who try to get new people in, try to get people fit, try to get people, you know, working out and exercising. That's just something we've been doing for decades now. Um, how did your business take a turn maybe in the early past two years when well, you do a lot of stuff outside anyways. I mean, I, I follow your Instagram. I yes. think a lot of people follow you. You're always outside anyways. You have what we call, you just have a, a practical approach. You have just equipment. You're out in the park. 
you have dip bars, you have a bench set up, which I, I always think whenever I see this, when you guys are up early in the morning, like who cares all that stuff to where you are? Who's doing it? Are you making these guys do it? <laughs> Can we park? Are ready? Are you like ready there? Like, you know, everything's set up. You're like, I brought it out. You guys, let's go. Is it, is that it, stuff it, there already? And, it's, and it's like a whole bunch of ants just moving stuff. Okay. You know, I, I, I open up my truck and boom, it all just gets set. Okay. Up. That's what I'm thinking. I'm like, does he have these guys? Does he just pull up the truck in the morning? You're waiting there with a cup of coffee. You're, you know, it's cold. Um, this time of year, at least. I mean, yeah, kind of on the chilling. same weather pattern. Yeah. We're it's about mid thirties here too. You have the truck open. You have your, your, your guys come unload it. You guys start warming up. You're in that area. That's kind of how I see it. You're making them do all the work. You have to learn this stuff anyways. You might as well start carrying the equipment. And, yeah, uh, I'm you know. doing the work with them. They, these are my workouts. I just invite people to join me. Uh, okay. Now, I, I'm also coaching, you mm -hmm. know, when I see technique issues that need to happen. But I say, here's the workout we're doing. You know, if you got questions, let's go. And we all kind of bounce around different groups, you know, hit different areas of the workout. So we're not all waiting for a bench press. Uh, but it, it's kind of like juggling a little bit, um, okay, but at yeah. the same time, able to uh, be in a position to just watch everybody and just make sure that they're they're doing things. OK, properly. so this is your morning workout. You're out there. You just happen to have invite these guys in to kind of make it a morning outdoor it's, workout. It's so then fun. You coach them. OK, so yeah. but because I know you're also a facilitator and instructor um, that you've done this uh, at I'm assuming at the academy, are you, yeah. do you still do that as part of your job as a facilitator coach? Um, I guess. Instructor? Yeah, I, I do. I do some work at the Naval Academy as well mm -hmm. for kids that are doing spec op stuff, but as well as kids that are just trying to get through the swimming test. Mm -hmm. um, but then also work with some admissions programs too, and work with the sure. high school kids that visit and, you know, introduce them to the military style of fitness, which is a, which is something I take very seriously because sometimes I am a person's first introduction to the way military, you know, groups work out. Sure. And um, I try to make that fun, enjoyable, educational, um, all rolled into one because, you know, there's a 17 year old kid on the other side of that, that, you know, has got a, variety of roads that that person could take the last thing i want to do is just make this a miserable experience and that person you know can you oh, know has I'm, that mentality for the rest of their life i'm sure it's daunting just trying to get into any of that you know whether you're trying to get into the academies or whether you're just trying to uh, enlist the paperwork involved i mean that's just i mean any high school student i mean it, I have a high school. I have a 15 uh, year old that I can't imagine him trying to figure all that stuff out. He can oh, barely, he can barely yeah. do the garbage uh, on occasion. So just try to go through that process. It's just, I'm sure just daunting. Have yeah, you seen it? it I'm sorry. Go ahead. Have you seen it? How have you seen it change through the years as far as the process of getting into um, the administrative work? Has it changed much? And maybe even the past few years has it, you know, just because of things have changed uh, as far as, uh, uh, military and maybe admissions and just how the pandemic has, has that changed anything? The process, have you seen it evolve? Is it more complicated? Are there different arenas? Are people seeing different options for careers too with this, which I can imagine it can just because it's growing so much. There's different avenues in the military that you don't have to do continue to go through be career. Maybe you could be I don't know, work for any of the academies. Has, have you seen that branch off where there's more options for kids? Um, yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of options out there for folks, uh, whether it's, you know, service academies, ROTC, OCS, um, it, you know, enlisting and a variety of jobs um, that people, I mean, they're for the jobs that they need people for, like, for instance, right now, Army Special Forces need people, Air Force Pararescue, and, you know, the other special warfare groups in, in the Air Force and Army. They're, they're paying people, um, you know, basically a signing bonus. They don't get it until they actually finish the, the pipeline. Um, but, you know, they're, you, you get up to $40,000, $50,000 added to your salary 
if you can make it through that pipeline, you know, it, whereas the Navy SEAL program is just the opposite. They are overmanned right now. And, um, you know, so recruitment is decreased and attrition is increased. Um, so it, it just depends, you know, it, it, they, they all go through these weird cycles. I'd say COVID was one of those weird ones where I was advising people. I said, you know what, just, just wait to join after these quarantines are over. Right. Cause let me tell you, I mean, it, it kind of quarantines kind of suck and stay at home orders, you know, kind of suck when you're civilian, but imagine you're now on a military kind base of, and you can't do anything. Can't you can't yeah. leave your room. I mean, people bringing you food. I mean, it's just, come on, yeah, you know, I, just stay, just stay home, you know, go to community college for a year and then let's, let's figure this out next year. You know, cause everybody's life was, you know, you know, up and up in oh, the yeah, air. Sure. And that's why I, I was familiar with like, okay, that's kind of what brought this about just doing this because I was stuck at home. Then I figured, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to invest in, you know, cause I was doing uh, teaching online and it was pretty miserable for a lot of my students because they just hated it. They had to be out. They were emailing me, you know, we need to do more. And I'm thinking about, okay, what about the other businesses that coming from that standpoint, if I was running a health club or if I was running a business where it's physical, where you need people, you have to do this. I mean, so that's why I'm, I was always interested. How did they survive? How did uh, people survive that who are physical, who aren't used to just sitting around doing nothing that now can't either go to the gym. Obviously we find ways we're going to go out. I had, my gym was already set before. So I was always working out outdoors, but how do other people and I, then thinking you know, about yourself, how do you get these, how are you able to still do what you're doing until this blows over and then, okay, I still have to train these kids. They still have to get ready, whether it's not now, maybe they missed this testing date. Maybe they have to do it in six months. Sure. They were looking yeah. forward to doing it. They were getting, they were preparing, they were working hard for these six months and then boom, it happens like, oh guys, sorry. That's the, the stress that you talk about. Okay. You have to now ret you have to test in another six months and then maybe that gets delayed and then it's another six months. These guys who have been preparing probably their young teenage lives or young uh, uh, lives to do this test. And now they have to wait a year. I think that's probably how it works. They probably had to shut down a lot I, of tests. Yeah, it, it, it happened um, for sure. Um, I will say for me personally, we, we have a uh, indoor facility that we uh, go to during the winter because uh, the winters do get pretty cold here. I mean, twenties typically, mm -hmm. you know, some you know below freezing, mm -hmm. um, not horrible. But Chicago, you know, so yeah, I you don't have to tell me about cold. Cold is yeah, yeah. You guys get it with wind too. So, um, well, I we couldn't go to those gyms. Mm -hmm. So during during COVID, so we just decided, you know what, we're outside for the spring and summer anyway, and most of the fall. Mm -hmm. About pretty much, we would spend eight to ten weeks in, inside in, in the winter, and we'd go back outside. Um, and we do this winter lift cycle, and we just decided to do it outside last year. And uh, let me tell you, we had so much fun doing oh, it outside. Great. And we got, I tell you what, people got hard too. I mean, we were running Fast, weather. Sure. Weather was not an issue. We just ran anyway. We, we had to run a little bit more than I like to during a lift cycle, but that running was a necessity just to stay keep warm. Them warm, sure. Yeah. Uh, bear, but bear it, crawls, you try to get their hearts going, keep yeah, them up just, and down, but anything yeah. you can do it. Yeah. So it, that was about the only thing that changed, but it worked and people loved it. Um, the hardy people loved, loved it. it. I mean, yeah. I lost a few people, but you know, it, it's fine. Um, um, but we're doing it again outdoors. We, we liked it so much that we're not going back indoors. Well, that's what I've learned when I talk to current gym owners. Okay, what did you get out of this? What did you learn from this new model as far as, okay, you can start doing more outdoor work. It kind of hardens people. It gets them used to the cold because, you know, there's going to be, I'm sure, some cold weather training that they're going to have to deal with. And if you're actually doing it, it's easier to know how it feels. I mean, you're going to hate it, I'm sure, but it it's, it's just an element of changing 
how training is. And that's what I've learned. You've added outdoor winter training, I'm sure. So sure. that helps. Yep. What else did you, were you able to add into it or learn as far as adding into that structure of programming that, okay, this helps. It, it sucked at the time, but you know what? We've learned that we can add this now. Now we could add an outdoor element year round. Yeah. Was that it? Yeah. Was that just the winter training or was there anything else you were able to add into it that, okay, we, we learned um, something out of this? Yeah, we, we just decided the outdoor element year round was now the answer. Now I have a system mm -hmm. that I created over 20 years ago called seasonal tactical fitness periodization. Right. And basically what this is, it is each season of the year has a different focus. And if you're a tactical athlete or want to be a tactical athlete, let me say, this is a way to take some of those athletic strengths and weaknesses that you have coming into with this athletic history into focusing on those weaknesses. So, for instance, in the spring and summer, we tend to. Um, kind of deload from the lifting a little bit. So it's like a 50-50 mix in the spring of lifting and calisthenics, but we're starting to increase our running. So our running is increasing on a nice little steady progression. So by the summer, it's mostly calisthenics and running is our primary focus, you know, endurance and muscle stamina. We also swim too. Um, and then in the fall, our running progression starts going down. Um, we're adding more non-impact cardio activities, like more swimming in there mm -hmm. at, at the fall, but we're also decreasing the repetitions of all the high rep calisthenic stuff. And we're starting to add weight again. And then in the winter, it's a winter lift cycle where we really decrease the running, um, and just focus on the lifts to just focus on strength and power. And we'll throw in some speed and agility on basketball courts and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and what that enables us to do is to take someone who comes in with a certain athletic history or no athletic history at all and show them, all right, so this is a year long where we've progressed in your endurance, your muscle stamina, your strength, your power, your speed, agility. Um, we've worked on grip activities. Uh, we've worked on some techniques of running and swimming and you know load bearing, rucking. Um, and we are now in that year of cycle, we have just now created someone who is more of a tactical athlete, right? right. By taking their strengths, using them, but also addressing weaknesses throughout the cycle, you know, so they, at the end of that year, they're no longer a weakness. And I assume you do this, just, you do reassessments. You kind of oh sure yeah, yeah. Every, quarter, every quarter there's there every quarter there's something and maybe even before the, you know throughout the process maybe even monthly yeah i'd say about monthly mm -hmm. we are focusing on whatever that person's test is in their future just to see where it is and um i a recent development because like i said i've been doing this for over 20 years that system a recent development that really changed our winter lift cycles was a three to one block periodization cycle. So we took three weeks of strength okay. training and we did one week of calisthenics and cardio for the fourth week. So treat it kind of like a deload week, kind of you know, diff recovery quick. different energy systems, but mm -hmm. it was just focused on calisthenics and running and swimming, no lifting. And what I found was the folks were getting stronger when that next cycle came around that every four weeks they were getting stronger with their lifts, but they were not only maintaining their cardio and calisthenics, they were actually improving them. Some guys had PRs on the run, which was, I've never had a PR on running in a winter lift cycle. So just by changing some small things with a, you know, a 16 week block of training, mm -hmm. turn that into a three to one, you know, block of, three week strength, one week calisthenics, cardio, or AKA fancy deload. Sure. Um, did that for 16 weeks and it was. Well, that, make, that makes sense because just yeah. lots of, I teach periodization and 
have done it as an athlete, we used to use that a lot and just sure. uh, long distance training, whether it was marathon, Ironman training, it was always a, a kind of a 16 week block like that. You do a, a kind of a three week kind of load up and then you kind of do yep. it uh, a one week kind of either recovery or you call it deload. We just kind of called call, call it a recovery week where you're doing it, but you're just giving your body a chance to kind of maybe realize, a little less intensity. Yeah. Realize some of the fitness so you can actually see gains because and one of the things mm -hmm. that, you know, I try to tell you know uh, any student athlete or anybody who was training you can't go up your body just doesn't do this it does, it's not you can't go straight up no one could go straight up because after a while you start to break down injuries because i have a lot of student athletes that play you know college sports too and you know i'm talking to them about their training and how their coaches are doing it and okay you're getting injuries what's causing your injuries is it are you just not getting re enough recovery time are you just maybe doing too many minutes what is it and you know, just teaching them for themselves how to do this, you know, because your body can't go up. It's just not a mountain. You can't go up. You yeah. Go you up, have to listen. You have to listen to down. it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And if you have that structure with that kind of uh, periodization and I've seen this, uh, I actually kind of reference a lot of your, uh, your yearly programs, how you break it down in the months and you can find all these at stusmith.com, your books, you have so many books. It's just, it's ridiculous. You can do, you can have a whole class just on Stu Smith as far as <laughs> alone. If I was going to teach a class, which I think is happening at a lot of, uh, one of the universities I'm doing is actually going to ha start doing that program of tactical fitness using that book. in uh, I think a year or two, we're going to start nice. having that as a certification and a facility, but it's just a lot of what you write about and you've written about this for you know decades now it draws on all that experience and where you can see things that make sense in diagrams and especially periodization makes sense when you're dealing with a lot of athletes at a lot of time a lot of groups where you have to kind of do things at a certain time then recover then add in and it's seasonal you can't do what you do year round too, right? No, guessing, absolutely. No way. You, no way. You, the way you train your athlete, you can't have them, you know, well, them I, I will say I created that seasonal periodization system over 20 years ago. I was 30 when I did it and I just gotten out of the military <laughs> and I was, I was in SEAL teams for eight years and I was broken right? Because we had no human performance program in the 90s. I mean, I remember going to my SEAL team and my high school weight room facilities and coaches and trainers was better than my SEAL team's weight room. And there were no coaches and trainers there. I mean, it was just a, a weight room. That's you know? interesting. So you, you were just over you were to, you had to kind of what decondition your body or recondition it or just yeah i basically re rest. reconditioned i i was i was broken i literally had stress fractures in my femur i had an ankle surgery i had a shoulder injury had a lower back injury just from the work well you that know, just makes sense you didn't have that back then i mean uh, i i think we're similar age i'm 51 i just turned 51 but there wasn't any of that back then no you no you were just doing it just hitting just killing all it. the time. Right. And you that, know, yeah. I mean, I've heard of, you know, athletes of that, of certain genres that they didn't know anything. It took, they would say it took, there was one professional athlete, Scott Tinley, who wrote in his books that it almost took him like five to 10 years to decondition his body after the years of his being a professional athlete. Cause it just, we didn't know. We're just dumb. We're just hitting it hard. His body was so broken. It took him years to kind of become normal again. His body was so, his physiology, his bones, everything was just so deconditioned from overuse and just not smart. There, nobody yes. had that back then, even before then, but that makes sense in your timeline. You didn't have that. You, all you knew was to hit it hard. And then when you got out, your body's just destroyed. Yeah, I, I was beat up. And you know what I did? I, like you said, reconditioned. I went back to the old lifts. You know, I grew up a powerlifting football player, you mm -hmm. know, in North, North Florida. And uh, we started lifting weights in seventh grade. I mean, it was, it was a great program. I loved playing high school sports and wound up playing rugby in, in college. Mm -hmm. And um, by the time I, I was 30, I was just crushed uh, from, I mean, between, I would say all the athletic injuries that I had, and then the 
tactical job injuries that I also had uh, by 30, they all just accumulated mm -hmm. and uh, just hit me. Um, and so I went back to one of the first workouts I ever did. It was probably right out of a Joe Weeder, you know, magazine. Well, like Joe you Weeder know, just, principles. I was yeah, just yeah, talking yeah. about this week with what my wife's <laughs> trainer. I, I was making a joke. Like I told him, you know how I live my life. I live my life through the Joe Weeder principles. If you're going to live your life, that's, I was just making a joke about, you know, these are my commandments. These are my rules. Joe Weeder principles. If anything comes back to life, ISO tension. If anything stresses you out or you need to count hundred rep system. I was just making a joke of how you can turn your life through Joe Weider and his principles. Cause that was a school of thought back then that, you know, obviously just helped the bodybuilders, but sure. it doesn't help but, uh, everyone, but right. yes, go ahead. Sorry. You were That's what about. I did. I basically went to bodybuilding again because I had funny. to, I couldn't run because uh, I was, funny. I was jacked up. I could swim, uh -huh. which I did. And I did isolation exercises for a good three or four months. Mm -hmm. And come springtime, I was starting to feel better, started a logical progression with running, but I was still biking and swimming more than I was running. So I was almost treated like a, like, like if a, a marathon runner wanted to do an Ironman, right? He's probably going to spend most of his time mm -hmm. biking and swimming. Sure. Right. I was kind of like that. I was spending most of my time biking and swimming, a little bit of running, a little bit of progression. And nice and steady it took me six months to progress up to maybe 20 miles. I mean, it was very slow and steady, um, but I felt, I felt great. Um, it was good. It was yeah. good. And, you know, shortly after that, I created what I call my mobility day, which is, I swear, if you're over 40 and you haven't started it, you're, you're a little bit behind, but you got to start it. It's, it's incredible. It's life changing. And I've seen you start to add that in and let me just add you look just as for, i'm looking at the cover of i have a copy of you know i have a couple of your books but i'm looking at your first the complete guide to navy seal training yeah when you were on the cover with your arm shoulder just you know. yeah the, my my main it, pose yeah the cross arm thing it, it, yeah it, you at least you haven't aged it hasn't aged you outside inside well, thank you yeah I'll, thank it, you because i'm looking at the and when was that book the complete guide that was that Maybe. was 98, 99, because 90, I got out. Of, I got out in 99. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I, uh, I was just trying to work. Okay. If anyone, I was just trying to prove a point as far as if anyone's defined or kind of defined tactical fitness, it was you because you started at a certain point. So I was just doing that, but you, well, I will say as a business, one thing I realized is that, and, and this is something that I'm sure fitness or facility owners have to deal with gym owners have to deal with is unfit people don't buy fitness books right that's something i learned real early because mm -hmm. uh, i wrote a few beginner guides and it, they just flopped and you know everything that did really well were you know higher level you know swat team and special ops and you know other things like that so i'd you know if, if you can if you can find a way to reach the beginner market um, I mean, so, that's what we've been work <laughs> we've been working. We've been working on that I mean, for the end of time in health clubs. Yeah, when yeah, I was yeah. opening running health clubs, it's it was always the same people coming in. You already knew what to do, and that's the yeah. tough part. It's like if you can tap into the 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 market of everyone now, like the majority of Americans. I mean, there's yes. very few people who work out on a regular basis. You know, there's numbers, but the majority overall it's it's astounding the majority yeah. of americans don't work out if we could do that that would just be un unbelievable but yes it, because it's the market is for people that already know when i told people who i was gonna sit down and talk with you they already knew who you were whereas other people they would have no idea but they to me i was like oh well you should know because this is kind of something that this person developed something you've heard of you know other uh, brand names of things i'm sure but you don't know who they are. You should know who this person is. But yeah, I mean, that's just something I was hoping to get out of these past two years too. Okay, maybe we people are going to start taking care of themselves, work on their immunity, talk about it. But again, it's only the people that know. There's it, people aren't going to jump right into it just because you know there's something going on that you have to take care of yourself and and you have to right. build your immunity. It, it's not going to happen that way. 
because well, we're... I will say I'm sorry to interrupt. There, there no, have been no some worries. great there's some great stories about people who just turn their life around with you know this COVID cycle, mm-hmm. right? And they were able to lose a hundred pounds or whatever. But unfortunately, there's the other side of that coin where people just quit doing anything and they gained. I think I saw the a latest study was like the average weight gain was in the 30, 40 pound range uh, for people over, you know, d- during this COVID world. Sure. And that's, that would again, be the exact opposite of what you're trying to do, what we're trying to do, or what makes sense for your body to do is to, you can cut. I mean, if, if you just drop that much weight, you have no idea how much your body can just become more immune and just the, the yeah. strength you get there's so much research and uh, i mean it's endless we could talk about that in a whole new totally different discussion yeah, sure. but um as far as where you see it's i'm kind of pulling a Stu smith to through and uh beyond oh of, okay oh yeah uh, what that. do you see as far as now tactical fitness as a through what do we see it go into if you can predict or maybe you see it now because I see it on my end as far as, okay, now it's becoming a certification. We could teach it in a school. There's universities already teaching this uh, on the West Coast. There's already schools doing that. It's uh, just now coming here. Um, but where do we see that now? Because there'll always be, in the military, there's always going to be the need for what you do as far as tactical fitness. Law enforcement is going to need it. Um, you can become a facilitator. You can get certified to become uh, a an SCA facilitator in tactical strength and conditioning too, you can get a certification and make that a career, maybe work in law enforcement somewhere. I'm not sure how that works yet. Maybe do you have to be in law enforcement first and then get certified or can you be certified? So that I'm just asking now, where do you see this go? The tactical fitness beyond just maybe military life, maybe how it creeps into civilian life now. Well, I, I would love to see it, you know, because I tell people all the time that tactical fitness is not just for military law enforcement and firefighters trying to do their job. It is actually you being able to be an asset in certain situations within your own home. Mm-hmm. Right? Can you carry a loved one out of a building when it's burning? Uh, you know, can you, you know, handle yourself in a certain situation whether it's man-made or mother nature um, that requires you to you know be able to rescue someone um, whether that is a carry them drag them swim them you know there, there's so many different you know avenues that you can take your health and fitness that will in one way or another make you an asset in those kind of situations mm-hmm. you know you don't have to do a tactical fitness program to do that you just need to be strong and you need to have some endurance and maybe some muscle stamina um, and just some some abilities besides being the person need needing to be rescued because it's i mean not because of you know certain medical conditions mm-hmm. or certain injuries that you've had in your life but because of your not putting in the time to become an asset so that i I try to teach it on that level Mm -hmm. as well um and you know every now and then i get somebody that says you know i'm just not motivated to train and then i say well you know you're, you're considering doing this job where your life your partner's life someone's life that you're trying to save will depend on two things. They're going to depend on your knowledge base of your tactical skills, but it's also going to depend on your fitness level, right? Those two things can determine the outcome of life or death situations. And um, if that does not motivate you to train, you should consider another profession, Mm -hmm. right? So I kind of use this little reverse psychology a little bit when I get the whole just not motivated to train and, and then you know hopefully it snaps them into thinking yeah you're right i need to do that nine times out of ten it does every now and then i get the old oh maybe this isn't for me 
Well, but. sure, especially if that's going to be part of your job description, you have yeah. to do these things. Yeah, I mean, but I've also yeah, I've also had it. You know, for the the dad who's 40, 50 pounds overweight, hears that. And he's like, you know what? You're right. I need to really up my game and be an asset in my, my household in, you know, those kind of situations. So, or mom, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah. What I see a future Stu Smith tactical fitness centers across the United <laughs> States. Everyone is just, you know, uh, the gym is just, is, Maybe there's a swimming pool, maybe there's not, but it's just oh, that uh, would be, functional equipment, but you can put a pool in there great. if you can, and they're just all across. Everyone is just doing the programs that are scientifically proven to work, and it's just, that's how I think you'll take over, you know, the world in your genre that you create. I think you create. Oh. I, I don't want to use genre anymore. I want to use a school of thought because that's, I think that I guess it's, genre just seems too small of a term for what you've done and created for just not only military law enforcement, just I think how it it's reached um, everyday uh, athletes, a, a average group athletes that use this as part of their training. I've seen uh, a friend of mine owns a gym up north uh, that uses this stuff because he was former uh, military. You, he uses those you know types of things in his gym to help his clients and it, they love it. I mean, that's just, he calls them warriors. He, he, he teaches that ethos inside the gym too. So it's, great. it's, it's just, you know, whoever takes it and moves on with it, that's kind of how I want to see it move on because it's, I think it's proven. I'm going to start teaching more of it because I think it's a career choice that you could get into other than maybe just a personal trainer, athletic trainer. A lot of my students want to do anything sports agents. They want to be, uh, they, they, there's other options. And now I, in the past few years, I've added the tactical athlete that you, what you've kind of talked about the diagram, I've kind of added that into the, the course now. So they know you can do other things. If you're going in, you may go into law enforcement. A lot of people do that after they graduate, they want to maybe get in law enforcement, become a firefighter, whatever it is. But now you can see there's, textbooks you can learn you can become a facilitator you can go into that so it's if anything you've taught us that there's more than just you know um maybe just the military side you can become a civilian and take these uh, these uh, lessons and training programs and use it in your everyday life and career so it's i'm i'm glad that i was able to talk to you about you know, your, your program. And there, you have so many books out there that, you know, I've lost count of what you've pretty much touched on everything you've got, how to get into uh, the Navy SEALs, how law enforcement, FBI, you've added, there's um, Navy first responder information in there. You've, you pretty much touched on, you've written about a lot of things and you have a lot of that stuff on your website. I've seen, correct? Stu Smith. Yes, yes, yes. Stu Smith Fitness dot com. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, and I write articles for military dot com every week. Um, so I, I'm out there. I've written a lot of articles about the topic as well as uh, a lot of programming. Um, but like I said, I kind of focus on the specifics. You know, mm -hmm. if you think about what fitness is, you know, remember the term, you know, specificity. You know, they, sure. they used to use it instead mm -hmm. of type. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think they changed the fit principle to fit. It used to be fits principle. Then they changed right. it to fit principle, I think. Right. Yeah. So T's, type. Yeah, yeah two right. T's. And, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so it, this is really just a specific answer to a particular question that someone has. You know, what do I need to do to become an FBI agent? What do I need to become, you know, the DEA agent? Because, you know, be honest with you, um, you know, all these jobs that are out there are pretty similar, but, mm -hmm. you know, very few have the same fitness test, right? There's always something a little bit different, like the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center um, has a different fitness test than the FBI and, mm -hmm. you know, Secret Service has a different fitness test. And, you know, all the military branches have different fitness tests. They may be similar in some way, but they're a little bit different um, and they're evolving. You know, they're constantly evolving. They're taking the old calisthenics cardio model and turning it into a, a functional fitness model or a tactical fitness model uh, that has a lot more um, 
you know, activities in them that you will be seeing doing your job somewhere. Yeah. You know, and I think you've, you've covered all of that. And that's, I think what makes it, if you're going to do a diagram, you would be at the center and all these other aspects can kind of work around that. And that's why it's proven it works. So yeah, even though every state, every organization may have different yep. standards, there's still a proven method that works. And I think that's just kind of where you came in and kind of served that niche. I don't even want to call it a niche. I think it's <laughs> served a, a, you, it's become, you know, a, a proven. It's own branch of fitness. Branch so we'll call it a branch of fitness. Now. Yeah. And I think even that when it crosses over into the cultural and social aspects of the society, I think that's when it's become like it takes hold and you've done that. And, you know, obviously it's still a small minority of people like us who yes. kind of see that, but that doesn't mean it's not true. It's, it's proven it works. It just takes a long time. Kind of like, you know, a CrossFit thing kind of took hold. It had proven method methods in lifting, which, you know, it, it kind of came, uh, they use a lot of a tactical fitness, I think, and a lot of that and how they've evolved their brand and sport. They've added that into their fitness too. But I think it all comes from a proven tactical fitness background of what a, a person could do. And uh, that's just something that we'll see how it goes. We'll see, it's going to evolve. I'm seeing it now. So I'm just looking forward to seeing where it, it takes it. And I'll help it as much as possible. You know, yeah, the good news, good news about the future of it is that there is money now being spent on studying it. Mm -hmm. Like they don't only just study like the physical fitness testing events. Like I just read one the other day about comparing the mile and a half to the, you know, 20 meter multi-stage fitness test, you know, or the beep test, right? Comparing the, you know, the VO2 max grades of both mm -hmm. of those, which is very interesting. Um, but it's not just that, you know, it's also studying the recovery and the sleep and the stress and hormone levels of, you know, these, you know, active duty members. Um, so I think we're going to get really a whole lot better at not only the process of getting into these jobs, but also, you know, managing the training to get through them. And then the biggest part, and I think where most of the money always will be, is in that active duty component mm -hmm. where, you know, the military are, is paying physical therapists and they're paying trainers and people that are involved, understand tactical fitness in a way to be able to help, you know, the active duty guys get, you know, maintain their abilities, uh, but also, you know, work off that stress side of it as well, you know, cause there's a physiological component of stress oh, yeah. that, you know, if it's not addressed, it, you know, we, it will quickly become psychological and emotional um, if, yeah. if it's I not mean, addressed. Well, so. we see it a lot in law enforcement, you know, anywhere oh, yeah. I mean, across Absolutely. the United States. Um, one last thing I want to touch on. Did you, have you, I'm not sure of your timeline. Did you pass through um, Illinois at all on your way? Because I know up in Great Lakes or North Chicago, it's like 30 miles from there is the Naval Preparatory mm -hmm. School that kind of gets guys ready for the buds program did you make your way through that because it's 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 up north and that's kind of where one of the schools is the kind of i think i'm thinking it's like a prep school to get people ready for buds it's kind of like a, a yeah prep after, school. yeah after boot camp you go to what's called an a school mm -hmm. where you learn a job so like if you want to be a sonar technician Right after boot camp, you're going to go to a school that teaches you how to work the sonar and mm -hmm. all that stuff on a, on a ship or a submarine. Um, but for the bud student, there's not really a certain skill yet that they're trying to learn. They're mm -hmm. just trying to take the deconditioning that occurred during boot camp and rebuild them for six to eight weeks before they go on to SEAL training. So, yeah, it, it is a physically challenging preparation program that takes a moderately deconditioned uh bud student per you know buds candidate um and just prepares them a little bit more before they go but now they've just moved it like recently within a month or two ago uh moved it from great lakes and they just send them straight to coronado 
Oh, okay. You know, the, 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 the prep school is now right outside of Bud's instead of being right outside of boot camp. Do you think somebody was uh, uh, tired of the cold up there? Because it was up there for a few years. And, oh, it's you know, been it's up there right for on the yeah, lake. Yeah. about I a mean, decade. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. prep school was right on the lake. And I'm imagining them because they have their own beach too area too. It's right off Lake Michigan. I'm about three miles and it's about, and they're right on the lake. Like, so you're getting that wind effect. You're getting that cold. It, it couldn't be a worse uh, area oh, it, to do yeah. outdoor winter conditioning if you're in there in the winter, being out there on that beach near there. So I just wondered if you had passed through there in your early stages or that came much later. As the program evolved, they needed a kind of a prep school maybe. Yeah, they didn't start that until maybe 2009. Okay. 2008, 2009. Okay, so and I, I, went through, I went through training in 91. Okay, so that was uh, much later. Sure. I didn't know the yeah. history of when that, because there was always a naval base there decades and decades ago. Yes. I thought maybe it was there, and I just now heard about it, you know, in uh, a few years ago as uh, they passed through there. And I'm thinking that's a terrible place to have, you know, outdoor <laughs> unless, yeah, it's, unless it's the summer. Yeah, summer's yeah. fine. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. in the winter, that location couldn't be any worse if you wanted to do outdoor training or Absolutely. if you think of it, as you learned, being outdoors can actually help and harden. Absolutely. I mean, you're going to be outside Running. doing most of these jobs. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to get used to and understand dressing, you know, uh, layering, you know, sure. understand all these little things that uh, you're going to learn. You know, there, there's some mornings I'm wearing two sweatshirts, right? And a pair of gloves and, you know, maybe a second layer on my legs, you know, just to so I don't freeze. Um, you probably have yeah, a whole I, chapter of that in your book. You could probably just how to <laughs> cold weather gear. I, I think you can make a whole, you could, you know, I, I think uh, after these last, last year and this year coming, mm -hmm. um, it's not a bad idea. Yeah. Not you got a chapter. Idea. Why not? You got to evolve yeah. it somewhere because yeah. you have to get dressed, but uh, okay. Stu, I know you're a busy person. You're probably off to running more camps and um, I appreciate your time. I know.